New Jersey is a great state because we are a manufacturing state. And you, you are the manufacturing heroes. You're essential. You keep New Jersey and the world moving. All right. So again, this is the uh, How to Remain Agile and Create Opportunity in Crisis webinar. Um, it's a round table. I want to bring in uh, some of the thought leaders that we have from New Jersey. Um, and the conversation really got started when uh, I was asked to connect with Christina and Bart Henderson, actually, from Henderson Promos. And they were manufacturing PPE um, in New Jersey and then really trying to bring the whole network together. They had to jump on the need at first, taking it wherever they could. And then now they've actually been able to live in the crisis mode and really work the, the process to, to fine tune it a little bit more. And I know I did a success story with Bill uh, Dewar from Hatteras Press uh, in the midst of COVID, who is manufacturing face shields, just trying to help the, the cause. Same with Mike Seitel uh, from Norwalk. Um, it, it was a challenge to figure out what can and can't be done to help the PPE void that was uh, impacting the entire state, the country, and, and really the world. Um, and then Jim Hoffman, actually a, a STEM teacher and actually a teacher of the year from Newton High School this year, um, jumped on the, uh, the initiative himself and, and takes different challenges, not a manufacturer per se, but he has capabilities. He had a workshop, he had 3D printers and he started manufacturing the bands and the individual components for uh, face shields, so getting that, those masks and dropping them off hand delivering most cases to uh, assisted living homes and, and other critical industries and hospitals throughout New Jersey. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I'm really, really excited to get started. And uh, this first question is for Christina, Bart, Bill and Mike. Um, when COVID first started impacting your business, not when it first started breaking out in, in the United States, but when you guys first started feeling the pressure, what was your first reaction? And, and even Jim, this really kind of fits well for you, but I'll touch on you in a little bit. So what was your first reaction? Let's start with Christina and Bart. Sure. So, um, you know, when COVID uh, first hit and, and we all had to go on lockdown, right? Initially, we were, you know, worried. Um, we go to a lot of community events. And so that's really how we build our business. We hold a lot of events and then we go to a lot of events. I'd say like four to five days each week. Uh, we, we're at breakfast, lunch, dinner events where we meet uh, potential clients um, or we just are just out there in the community uh, building our relationships. So that's really the bread and butter of our business. We're you know face-to-face -face, um, meeting with making new leads. And so when the pandemic happened, all of a sudden, all those events were canceled, right? And, um, you know, we had to really look at our business and we were really worried because that's the main source of how we get our new business is at these events. So um, when the pandemic first happened, we had to look because our promo business, we brand um, promotional products uh, is what we do. So we put logos on anything like t-shirts, hats, uh, apparel, anything, um, signage, surfboards, golf bags, you name it. So um, of course, so, so many of our customers are getting them for the events. So that's when we really um, had to really look at our business. Gotcha. And, and where are you guys located? So in we're located Jersey. in Red Bank uh, in Monmouth County is where our business is located. But we have clients nationwide. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we work with clients all over. So, so Bill, um, again, different industry, but how did, what was your first reaction when COVID really started putting pressure on business? Yeah. So my first reaction, you know, we kind of took, uh, there were two things that were kind of ringing through our heads as this started to come to fruition. And one was, you know, how do we keep our employees safe? I've got 300 full-time employees. Uh, we're manufacturing. So social distancing wasn't really a word at the beginning of this. Now we're all very familiar with it. Um, so how do I keep my employees safe? How do I keep the business running without significant interruption? Is my business going to be deemed essential? Like all those things were going through our heads. Um, you know, so as a leader of the business, I, I got ahead of it a little bit. Um, I had some insight as to what was going on over in China and what was happening there. So as it started to hit here, we moved all of our meetings to virtual while we still had everybody on site. So we kind of started practicing some of the things we thought we were going to need to put into action. Um, within our manufacturing facility, we implemented work zones. So if you had a certain role, you were 
limited to a certain zone, um, directed to use a certain entrance, a certain bathroom, eat at a certain time. So we started practicing these fundamentals before um, kind of the government was giving us any guidance. And to be honest, my employees were looking at me like I was a little crazy. Um, but then about three weeks down the road, they were understanding of where I was coming from. And uh, we were able to, you know, run the business and keep our employees safe without having uh, any real major impact. And then, you know, as COVID started to hit and started to impact our customers, it obviously had a large impact on our, our sales. We're a printing company. Uh, mm -hmm. We work with major corporations from the pharmaceutical industry to automotive to retail. Um, and we saw some of those industries remain strong through the pandemic and we saw others come to a screeching halt. Um, so we needed to figure out how we could make up that lost revenue and uh, really, you know, continue to forge ahead. And, and we tried to get creative. We went into like a product development mode and we started manufacturing face shields, uh, temporary bed frames for pop-up hospitals. That's right. We connected with a lot of our suppliers. We connected with N NJMEP and just cast a really broad net to see what opportunities were out there and where we could help. So, um, you know, it was a crazy couple of weeks there in the beginning to try to figure out what we were going to do. But, you know, ultimately all the way through, keep the employees safe, keep the business running without significant interruption. And those were the two things that we based most of our decision making around. See, I couldn't even imagine being a business owner when this chaos hit. I really, really couldn't. Mike, um, I know you guys were facing similar challenges. Uh, yeah, same question. What was your first reaction? And then, of course, uh, I want a, definitely a brief uh, introduction of your company as well. Um, so what, so we, may, we high speed automation uh, supplier. Um, so we, we manufacture everything here in Jersey and Randolph. Um, and our parts come from around the world for, for our country for some, you know, where we get the supply to machine parts and all. But similar to Bill, we, we got our management team together before the, the government was useless because they didn't know. And uh, so, and we don't, I really don't believe them anyway. You know, God, God, you got to go, I figure industry is smarter. Um, so we went. We're much more uh, agile. Uh, same thing, we got our management team together. We came in a whole list. What can we do? Came up with similar things as Bill did. We said, okay, let's do this, get different. We bought all these refrigerators. So we had different refrigerators, bought microwaves all over the plants, you know, where it wasn't clean, but it, it was what we you know, got everyone's input and, you know, everyone, we had face shields we were making for the hospital. So we, we made everyone wear face shields here before anyone even talked about masks and all that. And people thought I was a lunatic a little bit. Uh, they're like, and, but now I got guys thanking me for, Hey, you were in somewhat of an ass making us do all this stuff. And, uh, but we understand now. And, Similar stuff. We were, we were, uh, we were busy or well, I'm going to say we weren't super busy, but everything, we were doing a lot of consumer goods work and it just, poof, everything just came to a halt. So we we're at that point by April, we were starting to get into slight panic mode, mm -hmm. which we're like, shit, what are we going to do? You know, I got guys painting walls. I got guys making a lot. All the stuff was voluntary for the hospitals and for COVID but we still needed more stuff to do to, to, you know, keep the business running. Of course. That's a challenge. Uh, you know, that's, that's two, twice I heard, you know, everyone thought you guys were crazy for being prepared, but because it, this was a crazy situation. There's no doubt about that, that this is not normal. And uh, the reaction was not going to be um, conventional, traditional, and it didn't, it couldn't be. And uh, Jim, again, this is uh, something that, again, not conventional, not traditional, a, a teacher, um, a robotics coach, uh, taking the initiative to really kind of give back to the local community. Um, you have a different challenge dealing with students, but you had to remain agile altogether. Uh, what was your first initial reaction when you started seeing the impact on your class, the school, um, all stemming from COVID? So imagine this, uh, you go out to your loading dock and you load the robot and all the tools and all the stuff you're gonna bring to your first event of the season. And then at three o'clock in the afternoon, you get a phone call, well, you can't go. It's been, the, the event is being canceled. And then you have to go in and explain to the kids why and what happened. I mean, these kids were teary-eyed and everything else. These are high school kids, you know, they, they take it very seriously. But um, to, to answer your question really for, 
for me and for, for us, when, when I say us, I mean my wife and myself. Uh, we had a little different interest. My son, um, a third year medical uh, student and, um, you know, down there at University Hospital in Newark. And um, I'd been reading a lot of stuff in the papers and I tried reaching out to him and I emailed him a whole bunch of questions because his hours are crazy and never hear from him. And uh, it took quite a while. Well, he finally got back to us uh, on Thursday night with uh, some of the answers. And, uh, you know, it was a little bit concerning for a parent to hear your son talk about, now. this is what's happening with, uh, in the trenches. And so um, it, it, really, uh, it really got to me. And then I remember later that weekend, uh, it was a Sunday evening, all of a sudden, I hear from uh, this young man, Rohan. Rohan Sawan is a mm -hmm. medical student down there. And I had communications with him like two years previously about all sorts of 3D printing stuff because he, the, the school was interested. And uh, he sends me this like alert. He's like, look, he says, you know, face shields are hard to come by. We, we can't get them. Can you help us? Do you know anybody who can print? And uh, it just kind of like threw me into a whirlwind. And, and in a matter of like a few hours, I started thinking like, well, who am I going to reach out to? And so really what I did was I worked with our network, our network um, for the robotics team, no different than what we would have been doing if we were building a robot. But um, when Rohan emailed me and then I responded back to him, I just like sat in my, in my chair in the house and I'm thinking about my son. I'm thinking about all the other healthcare workers. I read the Wall Street Journal off and on and we get access to that sometimes through the school here and um, I remember reading a story like very early in March about what the Chinese uh, doctors were experiencing and how a lot of them were passing away and you know all the, all the critical things that were going on in their circumstances in their communities and I started thinking about my son again and so that whole weekend was turmoil for me and then basically uh, that next Monday I started emailing some of our deep partners and STEM partners, as you will, to try to get some help for sponsorships and things. But um, I, I have to really say that I appreciate that Rohan, and I say this kiddingly, he pulled me into his trench. Rohan pulled me into the trench right alongside all the other medical workers and they like clicked. I'm like, I know what to do. And I jumped in. Yeah. It's Incredible. Actually, uh, one of the links that we shared in here um, was the article I, I interviewed you for, um, and you sent me the pictures of all those those uh, face shields on your on your uh, table and the, and the tour you gave me recently of your workshop. It looked le much less cluttered, so uh, it, it's nice to see those removed out of there and you have some space again. Um, because the the efforts like that from all these individuals it, it helped tremendously throughout the entire state and, and nation again. So. Um, that kind of brings me to question too, is, is how, how did you kind of control that pivot? Um, you know, what products did you produce and, and are continuing to produce? And what was kind of your products that you started producing and then had to fade away? Um, so, you know, where are you today in terms of um, remaining agile? Let's, let's start back up at the top with uh, the Hendersons. Sure. So uh, when all those events got canceled, right, we decided we had to do something else in the beginning to really uh, keep our business afloat. And so uh, when the pandemic happened, our our manufacturers who were making our pop sockets and fidget spinners, right, mm -hmm. they are now producing the uh, PPE. And we have uh, clients, you know, major clients in the state of New Jersey and nationwide who were coming to us for PPE and, you know, we could brand masks and things like that. But then now we were able to access, uh, you know, the other three, three ply masks and um, aprons and gowns and gloves and nitro gloves. And these are things that our clients really needed. So we had to really pivot our business. So in the beginning, uh, it was high risk. We were using our manufacturers overseas and I was on a plane. I was on the phone with um, private planes and cargo ships to get these shipped out to our, our clients who really needed them. And it was very risky because, you know, there were where we were worried about shipping delays and different things like that. But I'm so happy we took the risk in the beginning because it worked out and then but we decided that we can't rely on overseas manufacturers anymore it's such a critical time and uh you know it's just too risky so what we did was we now have henderson ppe and we have our factory where we're our warehouse where we're making um 
uh, three ply and N95 masks and we're supplying the major hospitals and states and Fortune 500 companies with the PPE that, that they need. So we were so happy that when we were able to pivot our business and not only um, survive, but be successful and also help a lot of people at the same time. Right. I mean, when, when this first hit uh, and I can, uh, I can assimilate with a lot of the feelings that Jim was talking about before when this first hit, uh, you know, again, we are a promo company. So think of marathons, galas, you know, things where people are going to be giving out products. Mm -hmm. So we went from really just doing, having a phenomenal year, one of our best years yet, we've grown every single year to down to 10 to 15% of business. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember the exact moment, you know, like you have these life kind of changing yep. moments. And I remember the moment when one of our hospitals, one of our major hospitals in New Jersey uh, called Chrissy mm -hmm. and she was on the phone and they said, well, can you, can you make masks? Can you get masks? And I remember the first thing thinking, no, I, I don't know anything about masks. You know, I, I can't make masks. And so uh, what that turned into is now we manufacture masks. <laughs> now we <laughs> <Yeah>. make masks. <laughs> so so uh, we, we saw um, that we weren't going to survive if mm -hmm. we just stayed the line mm -hmm. and did promos and made t-shirts and jackets and mm -hmm. golf bags for people. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, we pulled on any resources we had and now we're manufacturing life-saving materials uh, in fact, the state of New Jersey said to us that without us, they don't think they would have been able to keep their hospitals open uh, throughout this pandemic. And so just hearing that, that's everything we need to know that we made the right exactly. uh, you know, during this pandemic. So it was to say pivot uh, almost an understatement. I mean, we fundamentally shifted our business for the last year. Mm -hmm. And we think that that's got to be how everybody thinks moving forward. You can't, you know, I was in a committee meeting this morning. And um, you can't think that this is going to be over in two or three months. Mm -hmm. And if it is, I hope it is. Like, obviously, we all hope it is. But for your own businesses, you can't plan on two or three or four or five or six months. I mean, you should be planning a year, a year and a half, as horrible as that might sound, to be able to live with this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Again, it, I was going to, you know, follow up with were there partnerships made? And it sounds like that was key. Mm -hmm. So it's it's right there with the business development and creating that opportunity. And, and Bill, uh, same question. You know, how, what was the pivot like? And and you know, what what stayed um, with you guys? And or what was temporary in, in terms of product development? And yeah. So I mean, we uh, we saw a few other companies with similar capabilities to us, kind of putting some information out about the face shields and. I'm like, I can do this. You know, I know I can do it. I print on these, I usually print on clear plastic material. I can get the elastic, I can get the foam. Um, and then I just wanted to make sure that I, you know, there was a need. So I started reaching out to some friends who were doctors and nurses and, you know, similar to Jim, like hearing what was going on in the trenches. And it was like, it was horrifying, you know, hearing that people had to go to show up at work every day and they were sent, they were being told to bring their own protective eyewear. And in some cases that was like swim goggles. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. I don't do much business with the hospital systems. And I was trying to call them to, Hey, is there a need? And they were so bogged down that no one there could really make a decision. So I just said, you know what? I've got people that are available. I've got the materials. I've got drivers. I'm going to start donating face shields so we started just making them we came up with like a minimum viable product we got it out to market my drivers literally started going to nurses and doctors homes and putting them directly on people's doorsteps and then they were bringing them into work um and giving them to their colleagues so we started doing that um and governor murphy gave us a shout out one day yep. and that was great but then the next day he's on his news conference talking about sourcing ppe from taiwan so that's when I called the guys from NJMEP and I was like, I, you know, I'll be, I'll be a little bit more choice with my words, but I was like, give me a break. You know, I'm here. I'm going to have to lay people off. I can't continue on this donation route forever. Help me out. And they got me to the right people uh, at the state level. I got an order for face shields from the state. I hooked up with the state of Pennsylvania. I got an order there. I mean, that I actually created some jobs because of those two orders. Um, I was able to kind of ride that momentum through and, you know, fulfill orders for a lot of other companies who needed this stuff. 
Uh, and then we got into creating, uh, we created a product line of partitions for businesses and for schools. So we, we cut and print on acrylic very often. So we bought a bunch of acrylic, came up with all these different um, acrylics and partition formats. Uh, we came, we print. So we came up with a line of social distancing graphics for every different application, fully branded, customizable. Um, so we're still doing a lot of the partitions, a mm -hmm. lot of social distancing graphics. We've built a lot of great relationships with schools now, and that's a market that we weren't in previously that we're now in. Interesting. Um, the face shields have tapered off a little bit, but we, mm -hmm. we have them available in inventory if anybody needs them. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, you know, created a, you know, it created a sense of urgency and we were squirming and we figured out, you know, some new markets and, and how we could fulfill a need. And, you know, for me, printing stuff every day isn't always so satisfying, but some of the messages and handwritten notes I got from, you know, nurses or the moms of a nurse or the mom of a doctor for getting a, putting a face shield on their doorstep, like that was the most fulfilling work I'll probably ever do in my whole career. It was really cool. It's unfortunate that sometimes tragedy drives the, that fulfilling opportunity, but you know, it, it's, it's, I'm thankful personally that we have capabilities and capacity like that in, in our state to, you know, we have, we have a Hatteras Press, we have a Henderson Promos, we have a Norwalt Design, we have a Jim Hoffman, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible that, um, that you mentioned that uh, the work was fulfilling because it, it's, I, it's not all doom and gloom. There is, there are ways to create opportunities while giving back to the industry and the, the community as a whole. So it was a really uh, interesting point and, and thank you. Yeah. And in a hard time, it gave our team, you know, a sense of purpose when every time you turn on the news or go on social media, everything is negative and extremely polarizing, you know, which it still is, but it gave us a sense of purpose. Like, Hey, we're really, our company is able to really service a need here. And we rallied around that. And, and the team here did an amazing job of, of really, you know, making it happen. So it was pretty cool. Amazing. And Mike, again, uh, I know that you you started at, at with uh, I think MakerBot. Did they reach out to you? One of the uh, yeah, companies? MakerBot started with us with the and 3D then printers. and then it sounds like you really expanded since then uh, from our last conversation. Well, what well, we started with the face shields with MakerBot, and then uh, we partnered with a uh, injection molder in one of our customers in Erie, PA. Cool. So then they just they built the mold in two weeks and started sending us the face shield which you could just pump them out like crazy. Then. Mm -hmm. And they, so they just shipped us the face shields from the mold. And um, so we did all the cutting of the, uh, whatever the, uh, not our acrylic, but it's uh, whatever the plastic is there that mm -hmm. they use on that. But ours was a little different. We, cause like right when it hit it, it's like our big customers are like Unilever, Colgate, Palmolive and they just, everything just, they just cut their budgets. Boom. We're not spending any on capital equipment. And so we're like, we're starting to get real, real thin. And, you know, we're paying guys to do the face shields and uh, doing everything with some R and D work and everything we could, but you know, that doesn't go forever. Um, and yeah. then, uh, so ours kind of, it, it was almost, I won't say fell in our lap, but we do all the um, deodorants for one big customer in New York, uh, assembly equipment. And they, they called me on a Friday night and they said, Hey, we need your help. We're flying to Abbott labs on, uh, over the weekend. We'll call you after Sunday night. They send me an email. Looks like it's a go. We're going to call you on Wednesday. I don't even know what it is. You know, <laughs> it could have been, they needed a, 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 a bolt from us yeah. or something. And then uh, Wednesday night, they called. I'm like, well, nothing's going on. It was like six o'clock. Um, and I'm still here at work. You know, most of, we had sent all engineering remote at that point, just to factories working on different mm -hmm. shifts and all. But uh, then they called and they're like, all right, here it is. Here's the pictures. Boom. This is the automation they got doing their PCR uh, test. We need, it, we need this done. And I'm looking and we're like looking. I'm like, okay. I'm like looking at the different things. I'm like, it's a pretty hard job. And uh, uh, they said, it's going to be a partnership. We're going to ATS, which is like a 10,000 person company out of Canada. 
it's like they buy gobble up all the machine builders around the country and they said we want you to do this and i'm like looking i said okay i got to figure out a way to do it in the meantime we had to come up with something we patented to do it um but i'm like all right and they go well here's the deal you got 24 hours to give us a quote and i said 24 hours i didn't even know how to do this and it's just photos of uh it was, this, uh, it was this thing here. This, this, you see it on the news a lot. Putting yeah. all the BBs and this and rubber parts together and all. Uh, Trump had it on TV all the time. Um, the big uh, COVID test. And then and I'm like, all right. And they said, give us a price. You got to have it done in 12 weeks. I'm like, what done? The system built. I was like, holy crap. Uh, this normally, the, what it was, was a 40 week build plus with all the validation and just the design. We had no design. So we got everyone together on, uh, I said, here it is. We, well, we, we called our applications guys. We came in at like 5 a.m. that day, next day, came up with a concept on a couple pieces of paper, <laughs> worked on three of us. We split up, worked on the pricing to figure out what it would cost. And then we went and I called them up. I said, hey, can I just get my whole company together and give you everything 8 a.m.? Can I have another 12 hours? And they're like, all right. And then and then we went and uh, got, I got the whole company. I said, here's the deal. We got this job. We're going to have to work like we've never worked before. It's going to help the country with all these tests. But I mean, literally engineering is going to have to put every person on this seven days a week for, you know, I'm talking 12, 15 hour days eat for every person. And then I'm like, I'm not going to do it unless you all do agree mm -hmm. to it. So, um, you know, here's what we got. And the factory, we're going to have to go to multiple shifts because we've never done that before. We had to talk to our purchasing guys. Do you guys, can you guys confirm that we got suppliers? I mean, we're, you know, we probably had to buy, uh, you know, on machined parts, probably $3 million of parts. Like we trained with this. Uh, we did all these trays for Abbott with all the PCR tubes and all. We bought three miles of aluminum to machine it. Um, just, it was crazy. And then, uh, then, you know, I gave the guy and they said, go. And the guy's like, here's 50 grand start. You're behind. <laughs> Crap. Yeah. And then it's like, and then it just went, it, it was just, it was pretty neat what we did and mm -hmm. uh, learned a lot. Mm -hmm. and, but it was fun. Fun. Good word, right? <laughs> For me, it's fun. I like pressure. Of course. I mean, it, it, and, and also going back to what Bill said, fulfilling what the Hendersons, fulfilling work. It's important. And you can actually see your impact. You know, a right. call from the hospital saying that we, we may have not been able to keep open in the state. Um, it means a lot when you know that your initiative and your effort really kind of played a huge role. In, and, and that brings me over to Jim. Uh, how long was your initiative going for? And, and when did you kind of know that maybe it was time to, to roll or s slow down and focus back in on your students? Because I, I would assume that when school started opening up, that, that was just challenging for you. So how, how, do you, how did you identify that it was time to not stop, but pause that initiative and, and move on to uh, your other responsibility? Well, I don't know. It was, I treated it like a war and, uh, I remember in that first weekend, um, I wrote I wrote a big long email and sent it to uh, ABC News, and I asked them to get in front of David Muir and I said, "Please have him read this at the Evening News," um, and and it was something to the effect about you know tell the public to stop boarding on the PPE because the medical workers need it, you know, and I'm sure there were other parents like me who sent impassioned letters along to a lot of the news media and finally did get finally did get told so. I was glad to hear that in the news one evening. But um, I don't know, it was uh, all of our STEM partners that we reached out to in those phone calls. I mean, I remember right in the beginning, um, right in our backyard, we have a, a world headquarters a photonics company for our labs. And I uh, sent the request and it didn't take but like 15 minutes and I heard a response back from the owner, Alex Cable. He uh, was so good about getting behind us and right away you know let me know whatever you need save the receipts we'll take care of it you know he knew exactly what he knew what he was going to get working with me because i've had a good you know history and he's been very generous over the years that i've done this program so 
it didn't really take them uh, long to uh, help us out. And then uh, right here in our own community, we have this uh, gravity design. Uh, Mark Maruska and Mark runs a real nice sign shop. And same thing, when he heard what we were looking to do, he had a laser engraver and he could punch out six of these uh, face shield covers uh, like every four minutes on his machine. And, you know, I, I knew he had it and the same thing, it didn't take him long. Uh, he, he, you know, decided to sign on and help us. And it was all volunteer. And uh, the hardest part was just really getting access and sure you, well, you guys would agree, just getting the raw materials. And that was the hardest part. But um, we reached out to um, John Kennedy also from NJMEP and he did his best to help us source it wherever we could get it, where we could get like a skid load of the sheets. And I know uh, they were networked back and forth with people at Thor Labs and um, Alex Cable just like ordered like a hundred sheets at a time and whatever he could get, he would get it. And I remember one time he sent an email back to goes, if I have to go internationally, I will. So, you know, that was never a shortfall for us. Um, we had good help. Um, I'm trying to think it was also, uh, well, with Picatinny Arsenal, because Picatinny Arsenal, my right. point of contact there, who that's what got me in this robotics 12 years ago. Um, they're a, a founding sponsor. Um, as soon as I reached out to Sharan Berry, you know, my point of contact there, he helped me network with other teachers and some other teachers I wasn't aware of out of the area that, you know, that he had the networks with. He goes, yeah, don't worry. They have the equipment, reach out to them. And um, it, it was probably about 50 volunteers like myself, like teachers, technology teachers, coaches, scientists, engineers, tinkerers, people that just even were hobbyists that had a 3D printer and hardly, yeah. ever, hardly ever used it, but it gave them a great excuse. And uh, they, they wanted to, um, you know, jump in and help it as they could. Um, and then, you know, it was a little bit of a challenge managing all of that, but mm -hmm. we did, we, we did, we did get past. I remember those emails. I remember those emails going back and forth to the whole group. And yeah. it was just, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine um, facilitating and, and organizing everything because it was, it was all really coming through you. Uh, even when you were saying, you know, we got to all kind of handle our different areas. It, it in reality, it, it was a, the Jim Hoffman um, image that, and, and initiative that kicked everything off. I, what what I remember thinking in those first few days was when I read that story in the Wall Street Journal, that these that these Chinese uh, nurses and doctors are passing away, perishing, trying to treat people. You know, it was very clear to me if we don't take care of the doctors and the nurses, we're screwed, and that's a serious problem. And like you can't sit and wait; you had to react. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm so glad that all of you and all of us did. And um, which to me was, I was just looking to make a band aid and, and make a difference until some of the big people could jump in to relieve us. And that's really all our goal was. And it sounds like that's exactly how the plan played out. I know we had these, these, these little localized communities doing their efforts and, and making sure that they can kind of fill an immediate void while, you know, a Hatteras Press, a, a Norwalt Design, a Henderson Promos could kind of figure it out and, and work in the, in the bigger supply chain picture to make sure everything was moving smoothly and, and you guys can create and, and develop those products to make sure that that void was filled permanently in reality. Uh, as, as unfortunate, I'm going to keep on bringing it back to the silver lining, as, as unfortunate this situation was for everyone it brought a lot of capacity back to new jersey and a lot of eyes back on manufacturing which is you know a huge benefit in for today and moving forward in the future beyond covid so it's it's a really uh, amazing thing to see all of these different entities from all the of these different focus uh, focuses come together to really kind of solve a common goal um and that kind of goes back to you know um with all the regulations, all the, the, the rules that you have to follow to, to produce PPE, all the guidelines, all the different executive orders, where were you going for support questions, answers, and, and how are you, you know, managing all of that on top of like a Henderson promo is going from, from your best year ever to 10% of your business. How, how do you, how do you, can, can you possibly manage all that? Right. So, uh, you know, having resources, for um, our, our manufacturing sector, uh, being you guys, uh, NJMEP, NJBIA, 
uh, and to teach us uh, different protocols that we could put in place was great. You know, we had a lot of those resources for the kinds of protocols that we could put in place. The, the resources that were really lacking and that are still lacking, I, I think, is uh, generally the state and federal government supporting the USA made products now. And so, um, you know, Bill touched on this quite a bit. Uh, but what, what we've seen is, uh, you know, you see the government bids, you know how much things go for afterwards. And I know two other manufacturers here in New Jersey who are making masks. They're making N95s and they're doing what we're doing. And we're talking back and forth because this isn't adversarial. This of is course. we're all coming together. Of to course. Try. And, um, you know, while we do supply the state of New Jersey, we supply a sector of the state of New Jersey. And um, the federal government and New Jersey in general, they're not coming to their manufacturers right here in the state. And I talked to all the, not all, I, I know a number of manufacturers, of course, who are doing PPE. And the thing I hear time and time and time again is, well, why did they buy a bunch of those Chinese masks when ours are less expensive and they're right here in the state of New Jersey? Um, and then the same thing is going to go for the federal government moving forward, which is how are they going to uh, allow us to reach out? Because right now the only kind of funnel uh, is to go through FEMA or to go through uh, the VA office. Mm -hmm. And FEMA and the VA office, they're not, they're, they're not open and they're not talking to us USA-made manufacturers. And um, I might be coming off strong on this, but it's just something I really feel. I know other New Jersey PPE manufacturers who have come to me. I'm going to visit one of their factories tomorrow. And they're saying, I don't get it. We've got tons of masks right here. And we've talked to New Jersey. We've talked to the federal government. And they're still buying the Chinese brands. They're still buying all these other brands. So I guess my question would be for support, what can we do to come together as manufacturers uh, and really let New Jersey and let the federal government know, hey, you should look in the, your own backyard before going overseas. And um, so we had a lot of support from the NJBIA and the NJMEP and a bunch of local organizations who wanted to teach us uh, the protocols and how to make our employees more safe. But I really still believe, and I, I'm not just saying this from um, a reactive way, we're proactively reaching out to the federal government and the New Jersey government. And again, we are supplying New Jersey. So I'm not, uh, I'm not saying, but there's a lot of places we're not supplying within New Jersey. And there's a lot of places in the federal government we're not supplying that we could be. And I just, um, I'd say to anybody who's watching or anybody who has the connections, we need to, and I'll talk to everybody after this call who's manufacturers here too, we need to band together and see how we can have them buy in New Jersey and in the United States before going overseas. And that's, I wanted to touch on that real quick, the voice of manufacturing. Um, again, NJMEP, we're not government, we're not a part of the government, but we work very closely with our state and federal government because without industry and the decision makers working together we won't progress as an industry, as a nation, as a state. So that voice of manufacturing, it takes manufacturers coming together. Like that's why I'm so appreciative of Henderson Promos, Hatterson, uh, uh, Hatteras Press, uh, Norwalt Design, and again, Jim Hoffman and everyone else on this call. And it's gonna review this after the fact because that's what it takes, this open communication. So we understand that some of our challenges and pain points might be shared and that we might be able to work together to solve the issue. And, and Bill, um, you know, where did you turn to from Sora? I know you mentioned NJMEP. I'm glad we were able to help. Um, but what, how did you navigate all of this as a business leader, as a thought leader? Uh, well, I was in my, I would put my shoes on and go down to my basement every day and work in my basement. I mean, I would like, you know, I was working remotely, mm -hmm. a young daughter at home and my wife's a business owner. So we were kind of, you know, trading off watching our daughter and running our businesses. But I'd, you know, I was, I was on the phone all day long, making new relationships, making new inroads. Um, and, you know, I got in the habit of sending out a motivational email to my employees every morning, uh, getting on a team call two times a day to just stay engaged with people, um, just to try to keep the workforce engaged and let everybody know how great of a job they were doing and that I was doing everything I, I could to help them navigate through it. And, uh, you know, keeping our sales team motivated to go sell a new group of products uh, was a challenge, but it was just, you know, 
every day was a fight. Like I, I've heard a couple of people say they were, you know, in a fight or in a war, like that's the kind of mentality it was like, we were literally not only fighting for our own livelihoods, but fighting to serve a bigger purpose and making sure that everybody who was touching that and contributing to that understood the part that they were playing there. And, um, you know, it took a lot of effort and, you know, the, the, to kind of piggyback on what Bart said, the, the frustrating part has been like, yeah, we were needed until the supply chain kind of turned back on and all of a sudden everybody could get a face shield from China for a quarter, import it and sell it for 225. It's like, all right, well, you know, what about me? I've still got to keep people employed here. And luckily our business has turned back on and we've gotten our, our expenses and our payroll in line with where our sales are currently. But like, like the Hendersons, you know, we were coming off a banner year. 2019 was our best year ever. And everything we were doing from a business perspective was kind of in line with continuing on that path. And then this hit. So making those adjustments and, you know, it's great to be needed when you're needed, but, you know, we could still serve a great purpose here. And I think that's where we do have to come together. And, um, you know, my shop is more than just a print shop. And I've come to realize that and we can do amazing things when we're challenged and when we put our mind to it. And, you know, Mike's story proves that it's really cool to hear what, what we can all accomplish in the face of adversity. Um, and I know there's a lot of other manufacturers in our state and in other areas that, that answered the bell. Absolutely. And, uh, we can, you know, we can come together and build strength into our, our, our companies, our economies, our states, but we need, you know, we need some, a higher power to come in and support that effort. And it can't just be about, you know, buying the cheapest product that's out there. Uh, quality products produced in the United States are going to go a long way for our country and our, our, our companies and our families and our future. And I just feel like that was, you know, at the forefront of the messaging early on. And it's kind of getting lost in the sauce because there's just too much other chaos going on right now. Mm -hmm. So I think there's there's got to be a way where we can all come together and, you know, bring that to the forefront. Absolutely. And that's, that's a good point. You know, it was right up at front. That was, that was the message. And then, and then uh, as with any message and the 24 hour news cycle, things can, can kind of fade away quickly, unless we have an industry talking for itself and, and being that voice. So that's a, a very important point that you just made uh, was, you know, it can't fizzle out. It, it shouldn't because it's, not just our businesses, it's, it's all of the people that are involved with the businesses, our neighbors, our friends, our families, us. I mean, it's everything. Um, um, again, Mike, you know, asking for a 12 week turnaround when something would take uh, about 40 weeks, where, where do you go for support? Where, how are you wrestling with regulations, certifications? I mean, everything. We really oh, didn't no. have any help from government per se, it's all was internal. And our big thing is our supply bait, our supply chain. Mm -hmm. So thank God we didn't have a lot from China. Uh, all our, we have some really good machine shops that we use some, what we did the first thing is like, we put a local guy, I said, you know, Wasim, you're on, can you, will your shop go on retainer? Here's whatever, six, a thousand dollars a week just to have a machinist so when we call you at two in the morning, you got to pick up the part and mm -hmm. alter it. And then we had, um, we, had a lit, we had guys in Michigan, guys in Virginia. We knew them. We got them all prepped ahead of time. And, uh, um, and you know, it was a little bit of struggle. We had a letter from Abbott and the CD, Department of Homeland Security, and we got them for a bunch of other customers now. Same thing. And they, they basically said, I had to call one guy said no. And then, you know, Abbott got on with me and said, tell them we're going to have a conference call with the owner. If he doesn't agree, we're going to fly out to his facility. If he still doesn't agree, we're taking over his business. And that's what they told us. So it was like, it's like, it, it's like the, the pressure was like crazy because, you know, and then, uh, and I did similar stuff to like Bill did. We, I did weekly video things. Mm -hmm. So I'm here. I never did any, I never left the office and worked remote, um, but uh, for the factory guys, you could talk to each one of them every day, but it was hard always with the split shifts to get to talk to everyone um, and for more for the people working remote. Um, but then once we started the production engineer, everyone really had to be back. And uh, 
that was the hard part is getting us all back here. Yeah. Um, you know, we did all kinds of things internally, but you know, we're really at hundred percent capacity. I mean, we're back, everyone's here working. We got all kinds of shields. We got all mm -hmm. these tracing fobs. So you could tell mm -hmm. who's, who's next they beat when you're near someone and within oh. six feet and register it in the cloud. And so you can go back when someone gets a potential COVID and see who they're near and it, Interesting. stuff like that really helped people's was minds that, on. Was that provided to you? Did you go out and purchase those? I think some manufacturers might be interested in, in learning more about that. Uh, no, we, uh, we went out and purchased them and there's a monthly subscription hmm. and it, um, it, it really is fantastic. We, first I talked to a guy at J&J, What's it called again? I'm neighbor. sorry to cut you off. What, what was it called again? Uh, I don't know. I didn't do it. Um, let me find, I could send you the email on what it is, what brand. That would be pretty cool. I'd be sure to distribute that. Because we researched a bunch of brands and uh, we yeah. wanted one that we could, we could use. It would register who you're near. And then at the end of the day, we could put it to sleep, like put it on a, oh, um, nice. on a pegboard. Because I know if everyone takes them home, we're, they're too expensive. No one's going to bring them back. It, they're going to get lost. And that was the hard part, finding one that could go to sleep at night. Um, and it, it's really good. Like we had someone the other day said their son had it and they were with him. You know, I said, okay, you can't be in, you go, you're home now. And then, but we look up, uh, they weren't, they were only with one person for the CDC guidelines of 15 minutes in a 24 hour period. So then you tell that person to go home for the next few days. So it really has been, that's been a great lifesaver because we're building stuff for the vaccine now, and mm -hmm. we can't, we can't shut, we can't shut down. We're, we're it's no, eighty percent of our stuff is COVID work for vaccines or test kits, and it, it just it it's very nerve wracking keeping people apart and you know. Yeah, I'm nice sorry to on that. That just seems like a really valuable piece of technology that other manufacturers could utilize to. Again, yeah, I'll send you the information after of wonderful. who it is. And what, what it was. Appreciate that. Hopefully we get the vaccine soon, then we don't have to worry about it. But. <laughs> we have a point of that at the, at the end of this uh, call, actually. Um, so, Jim, how did you wrestle with the regulations? You, you're, you're not a manufacturer. You're not a business, per se. But you were producing PPE, and I would imagine that there were some concerns with regulation certifications, what's okay to do and provide, and what's not. Where did you turn? And well, as a as a teacher, I mean, I didn't, I had no clue, and uh, the, my my whole game plan was trying to keep my students engaged as best yeah. I could remotely, you know, because we when we all pivoted uh, mid March to to be at home and operate with the students uh, virtually. And everything, you know, we're learning everything all on the fly, all this whole way of working and how you communicate with Zoom and this and that. But um, I, I don't know, for me, I have to say uh, the power of the press was really very helpful. And I just want to give a shout out for Mike Kelly. He's a world class journalist with Bergen Record. And I'll tell you what, he called me very early and got a hold of me and worked me over for like 45 minutes asking me all these questions, you know. And I tried to give him as many details. And, and he, Put together a very nice story and that helped us garner more support and more awareness you know statewide and um, between the partner base that we had um, i mean i remember we we even got help from uh, colgate palm you know, mm -hmm. we got, we got that, then i started reaching out uh, my, my sister my, my sister christine i have to give her credit here too she was uh, sort of like a kind of like a business manager in a way she she had uh, she's retired. She uh, used to work at Hewlett Packard, and uh, she's fantastic. She's always good at stimulating ideas, business-minded ideas. Um, and so she suggested, you know, call some of these companies. And so that's where I did it. Reached out to a lot of these big companies that I knew had the high-end, you know, 3D printers, the, the amazing machines that we always dream about here when we're in school. You know, we have MakerBox, you know, Ultimate, yep. we have the small stuff. But uh, it was nice. They they responded. And through some of the networks and the, and the calls and the emails and the contacts, I mean, Bill, just like you, I mean, I think I spent practically every waking moment either on an email or on a telephone calling somebody trying to drum up help and support. And, um, you know, it, it was just, uh, my, I have to say, too, I have to give credit. My 
my daughter, my daughter Samantha and my wife uh, Mandy, they, because of the nature of the virus, I couldn't let the team, as much as I wanted to invite the whole robot, robotics team into my big shop to do the work, I couldn't do that. We parted it out though. The three of us came together and we put this uh, thing, we called it a box of fun. It was a kit. And so we assembled kits at one point after we kind of caught up a bit. Well, we never really caught up, but uh, after we did better with it, let's just say, uh, they had the idea of making this box. And then we wound up producing a, a short video on how to assemble. And then they, yep. they teach people. And I remember how many times my daughter would go out on the front porch wearing a mask with her gloves on, teaching someone, a teacher who showed up just to grab the box of fun. But no, Sam couldn't. She had to teach him how to do it and how to give all the instructors. And she did a great job. She really did. She was kind of like the, the manager of the assembly and everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and my wife jumped in wherever she could. And, you know, the three of us together really ran the show for, for those 10 weeks when we were doing it hot and heavy. And the nice thing was all of the 50 volunteers that we were able to bring in with us in the group, most of their work was just done at home. You know, they'd 3D print the stuff and drop it off on the porch and pick up more raw material. And I mean, yeah. I, I had FedEx and UPS showing up on my front doorstep like every other day. <laughs> It was uh, unbelievable, but I, I mean, it goes to show that you know it, it's possible. And and something that stood out to me was the your leveraging of the media. Uh, uh, manufacturers are really good at making stuff. I've been uh, a little background on myself. I've been in manufacturing or the manufacturing space since two, since I graduated in 2015. Always on the marketing side of it. Worked for an agency, just did manufacturing, then worked to, at a manufacturing uh, company just for marketing. And I've noticed that manufacturers are really great at building stuff not so great at telling the world what they can do. So that that gap, that communication gap is, is often uh, an issue. And that's, again, the voice of manufacturing, back to our conversation in the beginning with, with the Hendersons and Bill and, and Mike, with it's, it's fizzling out the, the message, but we need to continue to have that voice and be that voice for the industry and, and, and bring in other um, collaborators, competitors, you know, uh, partners, suppliers, people downstream, upstream, to get that message across and keep that face of manufacturing alive, the stigma is is, is subsiding. Manufacturing is no longer that dirty, uh, dusty facility that you see in the in the in the Ford assembly line videos. It's it's amazing. It, it's high tech. It's it's productive. It's 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 critical thinking, engineering, science, technology, art, mathematics, all involved, all wrapped up into one. So it's that voice, it's that communication that really just is the crux for the industry. Um, and I know we have it scheduled to 11.30 today. I want to leave some time for the question there. Um, but also, I want to kind of wrap up with um, the first case of COVID was detected in the U.S. In January, on January 20th, 2020. It's kind of sick to think that we're a year later from that, from that milestone. So what lessons, as, as a sum up, what lessons have you, have you learned have you, have you understood in terms of workforce engagement, keeping them engaged? You know, Jim specifically, how are you able to leverage the initiative to expand your network and engage students remotely? Really, what, what came about? What's your biggest takeaway from this entire um, event? Well, I would say for me, utilizing all of these um, distance tools, um, you know, Zoom, um, Google Meet, Blue Jean, all these um, go-to meetings. Not for nothing, but like, I feel like I pivoted into something really good and I have no problem going on and networking with people. I've been signing up for so many different um, seminars and webinars and opportunities and expos and all, all these things that have come about in all different industries. And then of course, making my students aware of them and showing the kids how to, you know, modeling the skills how to network and this is what you do and you know I share it and I, I've invited people on to have uh, Zoom meetings with my classes and show off some of the things that they do at work and you know this kind of stuff you never before the before the virus saw uh, you never would have thought of doing business like that but now it seems like it's uh, going to be the normal way to, to work and uh, I'm embracing it because I find like you know I can reach so many different really cool industries and expose my students as an educator you know, I can show them so many really cool things just by having an, even a short meeting, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. Hey, come on with me for a little while. And, and you know, and, and then the kids get to ask questions. And 
sometimes they're pretty shy, but then all of a sudden, you know, they, uh, they, they break the ice with one, one funny thing and then it, then it works out really well. But it's, for us, it's been pretty good. I, I can't complain. Uh, as much as the virus has been really bad and really nasty and I wish we didn't have to deal with it, um, the networking aspect for me as an educator, and I would, I'm sure other educators have discovered that. If they haven't, they should certainly look into it. Um, it's been really very good and very helpful. And I'm really, more than anything, just trying to plant seeds for the future um, with different you know, STEM, STEM partners, as I call them. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate getting the chance to come on with all of you today and uh, Bill, Mike, everybody, you know, I have to say it, it's everything I've heard come out of everyone's mouth. It just seems like it's everything we experienced in a nutshell. So really good, really good stuff. I want to turn this over to the Hendersons as well. You know, again, what would be the biggest takeaway from this entire event and, you know, how were you able to engage that workforce and, and keep people engaged and, and communicative? Sure. So uh... I think we've learned a lot uh, from this whole situation. Um, my number one would probably be, don't be afraid to take risks. Um, <laughs> we did take a huge risk in the beginning and um, it panned out. So uh, for business owners out there, you know, don't be afraid to take a risk right now. Do something different. So your business has the chance to survive. Um, yes. Yeah, so and, and then beyond that, uh... And again, I, I just want to reiterate, I hear in all the um, nonprofit committees or, or boards that we're on, I hear people constantly talking and planning about events that are two and three months down the road as if everything's going to be okay. I want that. We all want that. But uh, the lesson would be uh, keep planning for this to continue, right? I, I, that, that's at least what we're going to be doing is uh, plan for another year of this, a year and a half, whatever it might be. And if it ends in three months, then great. Then then it's awesome. But as, exactly. far, as far as workforce goes yeah. and as far as uh, marketing or, or anything, I, I mean, you really have, have to be uh, able to completely change and adapt. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody on here, mm -hmm. it's really great to hear your stories because, uh, you know, sometimes you feel like you're the only one. I mean, we, uh, I, I can tell you that we've never worked uh, We've always been hard workers, always. I mean, we're hard workers, but putting in 16, 18 hours a day is the normal now. And, yeah. and we've never worked. And just hearing all you guys, it's it's exactly what you're doing. Uh, and here we're thinking like, oh, we're, we're just working ourselves to the bone over here. Um, but but it's so great to hear that you, you, know, you guys are all doing the same things and yeah. everything you're doing is making such a difference. And if it is over in three or six months, it's because of you guys. It's because of... Um, the, the, you know, innovation and the risks and everything that you've done moving forward. So thank you to everybody else on this call for, uh, for stepping in and taking responsibility and helping everybody during this pandemic. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Again, even uh, before we get over to Bill, NJMEP, I think the first two weeks when we heard shutdown orders were coming out and and manufacturers were asking, are we essential? Are we not essential? And, and our point of view was, aren't we all essential? Don't we all play a critical point in the supply chain? Let's say that labeling um, company goes down. How, how, is, how is anyone going to label the, the pharmaceuticals? How is, how is a Norwalt design going to label their products to get them out the door and make sure everything is clear? Packaging was going to be non-essential. And how does that work when you need to package everything to move out the supply chain? They were going to nitpick in New Jersey, what is essential, what is not essential? And uh, I, I, I'm, I am eternally grateful for our CEO, John W. Kennedy, uh, for staying in the office overnight. I mean, I, I don't think the man slept for two weeks to make sure that every one of us had clear instruction on what the executive orders meant, that he texted me at three o'clock in the morning, hey, Mike, we got to get this email out to make sure that the manufacturers understand that they are essential. New Jersey deemed every manufacturer essential um, because they are, and because without them, the supply chain crumbles. And again, Henderson promos, maybe they wouldn't have been considered essential, but look at what they did because they were able to remain open and, and, and innovate and stay, you know, uh, moving forward. It's, it's amazing to hear. And that was a great piece of, um, you know, a great statement because it's so true. Uh, Bill, again, what, what would your, what would be your biggest takeaway and how were you able to engage that workforce? I mean, it's, it sounds so challenging altogether. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, in the face of adversity, you see people's true character. And, uh, you know, it was a time where people needed to be led. I know I was really hungry for some leadership and I wanted to hear some consistent messaging 
don't feel like we ever really got it as a country. That's my opinion. But I knew it was my responsibility to my employees to bring that every day and let them know that I'm going to lead from the front. And it was also my responsibility to be vulnerable and be honest and be transparent with them about how I was feeling. You know, there were times where I was scared for people's health and well-being. I was scared for the, the, you know, the strength of our company to see if we were going to get through this. And I just, I was just forthcoming and I let everybody know where I was at. And I think that went a really long way for the employees. And not only did they see my true colors, I saw their true colors. Um, you know, I, I did a lot of videos to that I would publish on our LinkedIn and on our social media channels. And, you know, I didn't really know how people were going to receive those. And, you know, something, I got an email the other day, a woman uh, was laid off during the pandemic and she was starting a first day of her new job. And I'd never met this woman in my life. Didn't even know we were connected on LinkedIn. And she emailed me and thanked me for my videos because it kept her motivated through the pandemic. And like, I was just trying to be myself and do what I thought felt right. And just like, again, another really fulfilling thing by, by putting myself out there and being vulnerable, like that was amazing to hear that I helped someone that I don't even know um, with something like that. And it sounds like everybody on this call, like really kicked it into high gear, took some risk, wasn't scared to fail because there was really, you know, no other choice. We're all forging ahead into the unknown and just, you know, taking that head on is really cool. So it's been awesome to hear everybody's stories. And I hope I can connect with everybody uh, individually after this and awesome work, really great job and good stuff. It's, uh, it's cool to be a part of this. And, you know, you mentioned it's, it's always nice when you hear back from somebody that you impacted, but if you guys think about it, everyone here has impacted someone's life probably beyond our understanding, whether it was a mask that helped someone avoid getting a, you know, this deadly virus or a ventilator part or a piece of, of equipment that you provided to uh, an assisted living home to protect someone's grandparents and, and the staff and the family members. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It really is. And getting people together like this to really kind of showcases and, and catalogs th those efforts, those impacts, and, and the continued push for New Jersey in terms of its economy, its workforce, and, and the manufacturers themselves. So thank you, Bill. I really do appreciate it. And I, re I really do appreciate your time here. Um, Mike, same question. I'm going to keep, keep it going. This little, the, kind of the sign off here. What would be your takeaway from this, from this chaotic event? Um, and again, we'll get into that question in a, in a second, but I really want to hear from you on how you kind of kept it. I think I got to mirror what the Henderson said that you got to take risk. I mean, if what we did, we five years ago, I probably wouldn't have done what thought it was possible. And, you know, it's just doing that. It's funny. I was, we had done a, a strategic planning that we wanted to get in the medical device field to kind of smooth things out from the consumer goods because a lot's going away from plastics and mm -hmm. all that. And we work with a lot of that. And um, I was listening to a right before, so we had done that. And right before the pandemic hit, I was listening to one thing and they said, on your, and had one guy that was helping us on our planning. And it said, you know, on a strategic plan, it's, sometimes it's hard to go out more. You really can't go out more than a year because the world changes so fast. <laughs> That was in January. I listened to that podcast and I was like, huh. I said, all right, maybe we shouldn't do the five-year plan yet. Just concentrate on the one-year plan with all the guys. And like we did it and like basically everything we had went, you know, but it's amazing. We hit all our, our plans for the, we ended up with, I think now we got like six healthcare companies we're working for. So it's like amazing. everything just shifted. You know, we've partnered with a validation firm because our big thing now is to keep this business going and grow it. Um, so now we're our marketing guy that we, uh, we outsource because we're small, but uh, we're, we're going that direction and trying to see now what we can do to keep us in that, that field. So that's going to be our next challenge. So we, and then how do we grow? Because I, I can't find, you can't find anyone here. You know, we're working with the CCM now, trying to hire some of their new apprentices coming out of the first cohort at the advanced manufacturing. But that's now the biggest challenge going forward because for us, it's we're, we're, we're growing mm -hmm. and we, we can't find anyone. You just can't find any tradespeople. I mean, it's nothing new. Uh, 
So that, that's going to be our biggest challenge now. And that's why I'm, I'm especially thankful for uh, Jim Hoffman's work. And again, the work that we do with our uh, Pro Action Education Network with apprenticeships, we sponsor registered apprenticeships in, in, in multiple disciplines, life sciences, food manufacturing, general manufacturing production and, and uh, um, CPT and, and the Manufacturing um, Skills Standards Council uh, first four modules for production, quality, maintenance. And um, so it's, it's critical to build that workforce. I'm glad you touched on that point because it's that is the challenge in manufacturing is, you know, we bring it, all, bring it all back here and we need to make sure that we have a constant flow in that talent pipeline to fill the gap. So again, I want to touch real quick on this question, uh, you know, because it's, it's kind of important. Mike, you, you, you touched on this as well. Uh, when you have a product idea and Bill as well, or even the Hendersons with this PPE idea, when, it, when you have a product idea, what was the lead time? You know, was it one week? Was it two months? How did you guys manage that and, and accelerate that process because of the, you know, the timeline that was unclear? We Let's paid a lot of money. Here. Yeah, Mike. If, if you want me to answer that, we paid a boatload of money for everyone. I mean, for getting stuff done so quick, you, you basically went to machine shops and said, you know, here's what it is. And like we had vibratory bowl shops that we use in Indiana and I just said, here, you guys get this done in nine weeks here. We'll give you 60,000 extra. I mean, you know, the, the thing normal cost is 60. We just paid double the price of everything. Um, and uh, I mean, that's what we were doing is just, and we were getting paid double mm -hmm. the price of everything too. It's, you know, but that was what we had to do is and hire outside programmers, fly electricians in from Ohio, um, it, it's just really the key is to have a good supply chain here um, is, is the key. Otherwise, we couldn't have done it. Wow. I can imagine. Uh, what, about, what about the Hendersons? How, how did you turn, or, turn it around so quickly? Um, trial and error uh, and emphasis on the error. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of mistakes. A lot of I'll, sleepless nights. <laughs> uh, a, a lot of broken down machines, you know? Yeah. Uh, a lot of um, tweaks mm -hmm. and, and really just persistence, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that, that was the, the, the real name of the game. The, the, what we did, anybody could do. It's just about uh, trial and error and persistence. And, and once you hit, you know, sometimes a, a part of a machine will break down or something to happen. You just go like, I can't, I just can't, you know, go through another day of this, but then you, you just, you kind of Keep take going. a moment, breathe in, and you realize what you're doing and, and, and that other people need these masks and the hospital workers need these masks mm -hmm. and you just keep moving forward. Keep uh, so momentum. trial and error, you know, mm -hmm. I think that was really the name of the game for us. It's a great point. Thank you. Uh, Bill. Yeah, very similar. I mean, I'm not, I'm a job shop. So typically my customers mm -hmm. are coming to me and saying, hey, this is what we need you to make. And I can make anything. I can make one of it. I can make millions of it. Um, but we went into more of like a product development mode where mm -hmm. we started with a prototype, we came up with the minimum viable product, and then we figured out how we could scale it. So, you know, we started slow. And then once we landed on what the product was going to be, we ramped it up pretty quickly. Um, so, I mean, we went from, you know, maybe three days of prototyping and then within a week, probably 7,000 face shields. And then Another week after that, we were doing about 10,000 shields a day. Um, and then it was just, you know, we got it up to 100,000 a week at one point. Um, so we ramped it up pretty quickly. Like we do have a lot of firepower here. And mm -hmm. it sounds a, like you have the capacity and capabilities on hand. We put a quick hiring process in place for bringing on some new people, a training process in place with the safety protocols. Um, like everyone else said, the biggest challenge was the supply chain. So I gambled on, you know, buying more material than I needed. Um, and, you know, then I just went to work on making sure I could get out and sell it, you know, so the donation piece kind of got us the momentum going. Gotcha. And that helped us realize that there was a huge need for this, um, you know, and then basically just scaling it after we got through the donations, we kept the donations going, but then we also got some paid orders in and just kind of kept putting ourselves out there and seeing what type of purpose we could serve. So a lot of, a lot of trial and error, a lot of different iterations of the product. We wound up on like a sixth version of 
of our face shield product now. So it's, you know, it's come, it's a much better product than it was day one. Um, but again, you know, we're, we're, we got them. If anyone needs them, let us know. Wonderful. And uh, Jim, I just want to wrap it up with, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a testament actually the way we were able to turn it around and, and kind of start producing that with the agility. Um, majority of manufacturers in New Jersey are smaller, under 500 um, employees. And, and that really shows in terms of our agility and our ability to remain flexible. Um, it goes back to our, you know, capacity and capabilities within New Jersey. We have the capabilities and the knowledge and the, and the, and the skill to make opportunity and turn opportunity from such a crisis situation. And uh, again, I just want to thank Henderson Promos, Hatterson Press, Jim Hoffman and, and Mike for, um, and Norwalt Design for joining us, speaking and sharing this insight, because I think that this is a real critical look at, you know, a, a sample of New Jersey manufacturing as a whole and what it takes to really be successful uh, in a chaotic environment, as well as a normal environment as well. Business is never easy. It's never going to be a nice, easy time out there. And it takes a few great minds and thought leaders to push their companies forward and, and lead the company to success. So at that, I want to say thank you to everybody. Um, what I'm going to be doing is sending out this recording to everyone that registered as well as our entire network. And uh, if they have any questions for any of the individuals on this call, please contact me and I'll be sure to put you in touch. Thank you, everybody. And I uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. New Jersey is a great state because we are a manufacturing state. And you, you are the manufacturing heroes. You're essential. You keep New Jersey and the world moving. Unsung heroes we now see.